All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the this part of our webinar series called the Ten Commandments of Continuous Delivery. Uh, so a couple quick things up top. I want to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. So we are going to be able to release the video later and you'll get an email with mm -hmm. all of the videos from this session or excuse me from this series this week on either Friday or Monday. Uh, we are going to be able to take questions at the end. So please ask them as you see fit. If you feel like maybe we want time to get to yours, we can take them offline after. So please still go ahead and ask them. Um, I'm about to put something in the chat window. I'm going to give you all a second to get on Twitter before I do. It's a, it's, you can just copy and paste it right into Twitter. And the first five people to send it out with that hashtag intact are actually going to win a t-shirt. So let me give it just a sec and posting it. Beyond that, it'd be great to know that everyone can hear me okay. So if you can, in the question or chat panel, just say uh, what your name is and where you're, right, you're watching from. That'd be great to see. But we do have a lot to get through. So I'd like to just kind of get right to it and introduce our speaker for the day, Victor Farchuk. Oh, thank you, Max. Okay, so this will be 10 Commandments of Continuous Delivery. Uh, before I proceed with the presentation, very, very quick introduction. My name is Victor. Uh, that's my picture, if you never saw me. Uh, I work for CloudBees. I'm uh, one of the consultants within the company, helping our customers accomplish whatever their goals are. Uh, I'm also one of the Docker captains, so my main interests are in a combination of continuous delivery, continuous deployment, using Docker extensively, and uh, quite a few other things that are not really relevant for this subject. I blog quite a lot, so go and read uh, read it if you're interested. Uh, quite a few uh, courses, uh, some of them are for uh, expensive, or not expensive, but for money. Some of them are free on YouTube, and books, buy my books immediately. That was enough for commercials. So let's start, why am I here? You know where I am, I'm in a hotel, but why am I speaking to you? And there is a very good reason. Uh, a while ago, I was, I had a couple of days of relaxing time before, before Jackie's World actually. Wanted to clear my mind and prepare for whatever is coming next. And then there was a fire, right? Since, since I was in US, uh, I assumed that that fire was American version of uh, burning bush. You know, everything needs to be bigger in that country. So that's my assumption. I might be wrong, but there was a voice telling me that um, humanity in general, especially software engineers, uh, went astray from the path. In this case, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, whatever you're applying. Uh, I couldn't uh, take it with me, the two stones that I found in that food, but I have a presentation for you, so we're going to go through it, even though I have no physical evidence of the close encounter. So before I continue, uh, whatever I'm going to say now, next uh, 40 something minutes, uh, do not represent my views. Those are his views. Those are not even views of my company, not my personal views. Those are his views. He spoke to me, so if you have any problem or you think this is not politically correct and you get offended, please speak to him. Don't uh, send hate emails to me or the company I work for. So now that we clarified whose responsibility is, um, Let's start with continuous delivery, right? Uh, at least uh, conferences, companies I visit and speaking with people, everyone, many, not everyone, but many are claiming we're doing continuous delivery because that's in, that's hyped. Everybody wants it and it's very logical why we want it because benefits are just uh, amazing. You cannot not want to continuously deliver something, especially continuous deployment, continuously deploy to production. Now, my experience is that most of you who are claiming that you're doing it, you're faking it, just like many people are faking that they are doing DevOps and Agile and stuff like that. That's kind of how, how we do things. Uh, so I'm going to try to prove that that's the situation. 
I'm going to go through some commandments, some prerequisites of what you need to fulfill in order to call yourself continuous delivery certified. Everybody likes certificates, right? So, and let's see afterwards whether, where you really are. So before I continue with commandments, let's quickly go through what continuous delivery is. It's relatively easy to explain. Uh, and I'm going to explain it very graphically. You will notice that there is no picture on this slide because I was told that it's offending. So continuous delivery is, or deployment is like teenage lovemaking. At least when I was in high school, uh, the situation was following. Everyone talked about it. Everybody talked about lovemaking. That was a norm. That's what you do when you're a teenager. I don't know, 15, 16, whatever the age is. Right? Everybody talks about it. The problem is that nobody really, when I was in high school, knew how to do it. However, everyone thought that everybody else is doing it. So, unless you wanted to end up being a software engineer, uh, you had to claim it yourself as well. So, everybody really claimed that everybody is doing what everybody else is claiming is doing, but nobody is really doing. At least, maybe the situation, I'm an old guy, so maybe the situation today changed, but at my time, that's how lovemaking, I'm not supposed to say sex, so lovemaking really looked like in high school. And I think it's very similar with uh, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, and many other practices that are popular. We all understand the value on it. We all want to do it. We're all claiming we're doing it. Very few of us are because it's very hard. A lot of things needs to change in order for us to really reach that stage, that state of nirvana where we are really, really practicing something. And this applies to continuous delivery as well. So, for those of you who are not following what's happening, kind of live in 1999 or something like that, I need to quickly explain what continuous delivery is and why do we want it. One of the big reasons is that if we continuously deploy something, including to production, the risk is reduced. And that's very easy to explain, simply, the smaller the change, the smaller the risk. For some unknown reason, our industry thought in the past, and some still think that if you do something for half a year and then deploy it to production, the risk is smaller. That simply does not even make sense because the more we do, the bigger deployment, the bigger deployment, the bigger the risk. If you can split that risk into very, very small chunks and deploy it frequently, the risk is smaller. That's simply physics. So, <clears throat> another thing is increased speed of delivery. Like, of course, business wants to have a feature in production as soon as possible. And the reason is very simple. The sooner we put a feature to production, the sooner we will start getting benefits of that feature, right? Instead of waiting until a whole project one year is done or months of the work are done, we want to deploy features as soon as possible not wait for the rest of, of whatever else we're planning to be fulfilled. Just deploy as soon as possible. And with continuous deployment, we increase drastically the, the speed of the delivery, uh, either to production or wherever we are delivering it. We get faster user feedback, which is very important. Instead of you guessing, or us guessing, what do we think that clients want? And then we make some wild guess, and then we develop something for a long time, and then we give it to our users, and we realize that they don't like it, they don't want it, they don't need it. Instead, we try to deploy very frequently, that can be hours, days, week, but not longer. Uh, then uh, actually we get feedback, we, we know what to do next. We know how to adapt to users' needs instead of guessing what their needs are. And finally, this is my favorite, is that with continuous delivery, we have real definition of done, right? Almost everybody, I hope that most of you listening to me, you are in some kind of agile teams and things like that. You have Kanban and whatever you have, and then you have a definition of done. And to me, the only real definition of done, it is in production. Everything else is faking it. When you say, oh, it's done. Why don't you put it to production? I will put it to production because it's not tested. 
or I don't put it to production because of that or that or that or that. That means that your faking was done. It's done when it's done, and when it's done, you put it to production. Otherwise, it's not done. It's half done. It's partly done. That's the only real measure of done, at least in my point of view. And when we employ all those things and quite a few others, we have true increase in quality because we have a reliable process, we have reliable tests and what's or not, and the quality almost, not almost, always jumps, assuming that continuous delivery is truly implemented and not faked and we're getting there very soon. Decrease costs because high automation decreases the cost, right? Why would you do something twice? That's kind of bordering insanity. Why would I do exactly the same operation every day over and over and over and over and over and over and over again? So we want to automate everything that does not require brain, right? That does not require uh, creative thinking and let everything else be done by machines. And what it truly means that when developer commits something to repository, that's the hu last human action. After that, we enter into some kind of world of matrix or something like that where everything else is fully, fully automated, which is very complicated because it requires quite a huge shift in how we do things, because that means that testing comes before developer and everything and operations, everybody needs to do their job before the developer comes to production. Unless developer is the only one working on a project, then actually really there is no, no, no not much shifting anywhere because no people to shift. And finally, when we do all those things, then, the really truly important part is that we gain time. That means that if I'm liberated from doing boring, repetitive tasks over and over again, you know, every morning you wake up and say, oh, what I'm gonna do today? I'm gonna do exactly the same what I, what I did yesterday. And then we complain to our managers, we don't have time for innovation. We don't have time to do things that really matter. Of course you don't because you're doing the same thing over and over again. You're doing something that can be easily scripted. So let's move on. If I did not offend you yet, believe me, it's coming. So don't worry. So continuous delivery, summary, you want it, everybody wants it. Uh, most of us are claiming that we are doing it. And most of the people I know, companies, organizations I know, either failed or they're faking that they are doing it. Like the same thing as every company implemented big data and every company is agile and every company is DevOps, everybody's faking. You, know, you just put stickers one after another on your, on, on the back of your laptop so that you can, you can prove how many things you're certified in, so how many things you're faking. Now, if you are, if uh, whomever is listening to this, it's very hard to judge whether you're sleeping or really listening, if you're really doing it, if you're really doing continuous delivery, then you are, you must know that you are in a very, very small minority, right? You are the selected few and I really congratulate you. And there is nothing from the rest of this presentation that will be interested for you because you're already doing it. You're master, you know everything. That's great. And I really applaud. And I don't know if you can hear my applause. Here it goes. Bravo. Okay, so let's go to what he told me. Ten Commandments, you know, it's very important. I don't know why, but it always comes in tens. It's never eight, it's never 11. So, so he passed me the same number. It's magic number, I guess, somehow. So the first one, thou shalt be agile, right? Now, uh, this might sound, sound funny because it's kind of silly. Everybody's agile, right? But I beg to differ, differ. Not everybody, most are not really agile yet. Again, remember the stickers. You put the stickers, say I'm agile, really, many, many organizations are still not agile. And there is a very, very easy way to check that. So if I would, if you would, if you would be seeing each other face to face, I would ask you, so do you have a QA department? Do you have operations department? Do you have departments instead of a completely self-sufficient team that is capable of delivering something from the beginning to the end without asking anybody outside that single team and that team responds to a single person, right? If that's not your case, you're not agile. That's, that's, that's really, that's very easy because you're just the same thing as you were before. Waterfall is something that uh, now you have, you might have, for example, 15 minutes daily stand up and now suddenly agile, that's faking it. So the first prerequisites is that you need to become agile simply because you cannot have lean time, you cannot have handovers, you cannot say, 
my part is done. I'm giving it to you. And I'm, before I give it to you, I'm going to open Jira ticket and then I'm going to give it to you. And when you're done, you give it back to me and then we can move to the next phase and next phase and next phase. That's Trump fall, right? Or water scrum or whatever it's called. Uh, and the reason is very simple. That does not necessarily mean that it's bad. I'm not saying it is, but there is nothing continuous when you open Jira tickets and give a uh, handover from one team department to another. There is nothing continuous about that. You can just as well just drop the name continuous and call it eventual, de eventual delivery. Eventually, it will be delivered. Nobody knows when, right? Because we have departments, we have Jira ticket processes and all those things. So you really, really, truly need to remove those silos. That's the first step. If you don't, don't remove silos, if you don't remove departments, there is no way that you can proceed further simply because that's, he says it, it's a commandment. First thing you need to do is to become truly agile without a sticker. So let's go to the next one. Those shall refactor. So for those of you who have a startup that started yesterday, this does not apply. You can skip this part. For everybody else, every organization that has uh, software that is more than a year old, more than a couple of years old, you need to adopt refactoring as something that is part of your daily work. I would actually go even further and say that uh, anybody who considers himself or herself experienced developer and does not spend at least one third of his or her time uh, refactoring, improving the code, is not really experienced developer. Again, taking it. So refactoring, and the reason why refactoring is so important is because you most likely have architecture of your application that is a pile of, sorry, that is a work of art, right? And you need to change that architecture into testable code. You need to adopt some of the practices we're going to get there that actually makes the code testable. If it's not testable, then it's not really, you cannot do continuous delivery, continuous delivery. You cannot do even continuous integration if your code is not really testable. And when I say testable, I don't mean, uh, yes, I can create three Selenium tests that can click a button and suddenly my application is testable. That's not testable. Testable application is application that is designed from the very beginning or re-architectured or refactored or something happened to your application and that day it suddenly switched from a work of art into something that is really designed to be testable. Sounds silly, but testing is, is, is a design decision that needs to be applied from the very start or your architecture needs to uh, go through very heavy changes in order to get there. But until your code is testable, you cannot proceed further. You cannot have continued something. Again, you're faking it. You're not listening to him, to, to, to his commandments. So, okay, so far so good, only two. So let's see, what's the third one? Thou shalt educate everyone. Now, to some that might sound silly, but what I'm seeing very often, when I visit uh, different organizations, is that suddenly everybody has a continuous delivery, continuous deployment, whatever you want to call it, department. Again, go back to Agile, go back to the first commandment about silos, no silos. You cannot expect that some separate part of organization, separate department, is going to create your uh, continuous deployment, continuous delivery flows, and suddenly that is going to automatically uh, change things drastically. It's not going to happen because Continuous delivery, continuous delivery deployment is a way of thinking. It's a way of designing things. It's a, it's approach to processes of the team who is coding and testing and delivering and deploying your services. If it's done by somebody external, how can that separate department know how what, what should be what should your pipeline look like? I don't know because I'm not coding it, but I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess that everybody's gonna use Java 7 and we're gonna have a pipeline that does wonders across that. And if everybody, anybody ever chooses to do anything else in their lives, that pipeline is going to fail because we have a centralized department that doesn't speak with anybody. But it's very, very good. It excels at creating pipelines that are forced upon the rest of the developers or testers, whatever they are. And we are going to kind of accomplish some kind of nirvana, right? So really, 
if you want to have a continuous de delivery de deployment, whatever you want to call it, department, the only thing that makes sense for that department to do, actually two things that make sense, is first create helpful functions, create ways to help developers not to repeat themselves, but don't take away from them responsibility of creating their own pipeline. Is their code, is their service or application, it must be their pipeline. The same way as we are hopefully not having any more departments that merge code from developers, right? The same thing applies to uh, continuous deployment. And that department, if, if, if it's ever to become remotely useful, should work on educating. If developers don't know what continuous deployment is, explain them. Don't, don't do the stuff for them because then they will never know. Actually, it goes even further. I, I see uh, teams that don't know even how to build their own code, but that's, that's extreme. That hopefully does not happen much anymore. But you need to educate. You need to help them the same way as, as testing moved from having dedicated testers to having testers that actually help teams bake uh, quality from the very beginning instead of doing quality assurance or whatever it's happening at the end of the project. So let's go, fourth one, we are moving forward. I don't know what the time is, but hopefully moving forward as well. So, those shall be small. <clears throat> you cannot have a big team that is doing something continuous. That's simply, again, that's pure physics. It cannot happen because big team is not really, if you have 100 people in a team, that's not a team. That's a, that's a football match. That's a school reunion. That's many things. That's not a team. A team are eight people, seven people, maybe 10 people that work together towards accomplishing a common goal. Anything beyond that, as I said, it's a football match. Go, go, to, go to movies with those other people. Don't do development, please. And the reason why they, those teams must be small uh, and uh, why your applications need to become small as well is because when, when things are small, they're easily built, they're easily tested, they're easily moved throughout the pipeline and deployed to production. Because remember, everything needs to be lean, everything needs to be effective, and everything needs to be very fast. We're going to get to speed soon, but in order to go accomplish that speed, your applications needs to be small, your teams needs to be small. And now the reason, and I think that many people somehow relate microservices uh, with uh, technical difficulties, that's not true. The major reason why we want to start adopting microservices approach is not technical, it's human-based. If, you, if, you, if it's preferable to have small teams, then you cannot have big applications. Because small team cannot can, can big applications. So if the team needs to be small, small, then applications needs to be small as well. And today we call them microservices. Yesterday we called them uh, something else. It existed for a long time, but the point is always the same. You have autonomous teams that are capable of delivering something at their own speed. And the only way to accomplish that, apart from autonomy, and apart from knowing everything that is needed to know for a life cycle of an application, is for that application to be small. And today we call that small microservices. So you need to start splitting your model. You just kind of start cutting it around, start separating one part from another until you get to sizes that fit a relatively small team. And then you move continuously throughout the pipeline. And by pipeline, I mean the whole life cycle of an application. <clears throat> the next thing is that those shall practice TDD or test driven development. Now that is, I, I don't even understand how can anybody imagine applying continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment if tests are not written before code that implements those tests. Because if tests are not written before, then you commit your code, it goes through a pipeline and it never fails. And it's very easy not, never to fail if there is no test of the feature you just implemented. So if every commit goes through a pipeline and there is no test, very simple, it's going to work. And to make things worse, actually, <laughs> I saw cases <coughs> of projects that add tests later and still, be, even without tests, somehow a pipeline manages to fail. It's beyond comprehension how can a pipeline without tests fail, but it really, really happens. So, Tests needs to be written before the code because then it's part of the commit. And the only reasonable way how to write it before the code is using test-driven development. You know, you write a test, a very small test, 
you implement, uh, write just enough code for that test to pass, run the test again, it works, it failed first time, it works second time, you're all happy, and all that is a ping pong game that lasts for maybe seconds or a minute, right, between tests and code. Very, very fast game, very effective, very, very hard to master, but extremely beneficial. I would actually go as far to say that everybody I know that practiced TDD for more than half a year could not go back to, to any other way. But even if you don't want to practice TDD, that's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but I'm gonna, because I need to be politically correct, I would say it's okay. You, you, you can pass through it, but at least you need to make sure that you, you don't commit your code without a test, right? Write it after the code, let it not last more than half an hour, but test needs to be present in every single commit. And if you really insist not to do TDD, ask Ruby. Yeah, sorry, if you're Ruby on Rails, you don't have to do TDD. That's exception, because Ruby on Rails is untestable. Everybody else has no other excuse. So <clears throat> that leads us to the second part is that if there is no, there are no tests, there are no commits, we already explained that, so let's, let's go to the next commandment. Thou shalt define your CD pipeline as code. Now, most of the tools uh, that are in charge of continuous something pipelines, um, at least those that started more than a couple of years ago, <coughs> they were all based on UI. Because UIs were very popular like 10 years ago. Uh, it was really great because with UI you can open some web page or maybe desktop application, then you can do, you can click and click and click and click and fill in a field, type something, click again, type something, click, click, click. 57 approximately, I think on average 57 clicks. Anyway, and then you get the pipeline. And that somehow automatically works. And the best thing about and in case of Jenkins, that would be freestyle jobs. They allow you to click through your pipeline and create a pipeline without actually coding anything. And the best thing about not writing code, uh, pipeline as code, is that you can actually claim that you're a software engineer that is doing something really, really helpful without knowing how to write a single line of code. I mean, that, that's brilliant, kind of. There is, there is no higher level of faking than doing that. However, Unfortunately for, uh, for fakers that uh, think that they're software engineers without uh, writing a single line of code, that world is really behind us. That's kind of five years behind or years behind. Nobody trusts UIs anymore for development type of work, engineering type of work. So, and there are many reasons why we, do, why we try to express everything as code. That, that does not even relate to pipeline anymore. Simply everything is code. Same way as we're not dragging and dropping, uh, uh, using drag and drop tools to code HTML, right? Nobody does that anymore. We did it 15 years ago. Same thing, and same thing happened to ESBs and then many other tools. Almost every, every developer tool that was based on UI slowly disappeared and was replaced by code. And the reasons are many, simply, Code is easier to reason with because it's much easier to write complex logic expressed as code than going through some UIs. Uh, it can be uh, put in version control. Uh, version control. Uh, by, by version control, I mean Git, or if you're unfortunate, that might be still SVN or CVS. Um, it can be code reviewed. It can be talked about. It can be read. We know what code is. We don't know what kind of uh, what things are produced behind those uh, those UIs. And Jenkins is, is, is one of those examples. We moved heavily into pipeline. Uh, there is no real reason why anybody would use Jenkins traditionally anymore with freestyle jobs, unless you don't know how to write a single line of code, but that's a special. Actually, in that case, uh, if you're an engineer and you're afraid of writing code, a uh, suggestion would be to come, become, for example, a lawyer. And there is no real excuse, so you can say, becoming a lawyer takes five years of study. I mean, engineering is hard as well, so don't think that that's, that's easier. You need to learn how to code, and once you do, uh, write your pipeline in code. In case of Jenkins, that would be Jenkins pipeline. In case of other tools, it would be whatever. All of them today support expressing pipeline as code. Uh, so, summary of all that, 
stop clicking, please. You're not doing anybody a favor anymore. So next thing is that that pipeline, and bear in mind that each of those things are prerequisites for the for the for the next commandment. So if you manage to get this part, this is already impressive. If you're already doing the first six, I'm, I'm truly impressed. Uh, and the next one is that once you create your pipeline, it needs to be fast. And there is a very good reason uh, to be fast. Uh, develop, what we do as engineers is complicated. We need concentration. And I, for example, when I finish uh, a feature, right, I want to start working on a new feature. And if I'm going to be interrupted two hours later uh, with a notification that my build of my previous feature failed, I'm going to have to start doing context switching. I will need to switch from whatever I'm doing now to go back to what I was doing an hour ago or a day ago or a week ago and try to remember what was the problem, fix it, uh, and commit it to a repository and do what's or not, all those things and then go back to what I was doing before. And that's very expensive. It takes me, maybe because I'm a bit older guy, but it takes me anything between half an hour and an, and an hour to figure out where I was when I get interrupted. So now the speed of the pipeline depends really how fast it can be. You might be wondering yourself. Now my perfect measure depends from company to company. I would say that the ideal speed of uh, duration of a pipeline should be the time it takes you to commit something, uh, lift your yourself from your desk, go to fetch a coffee, drink that coffee, maybe have a conversation, a few, exchange a few sentences from a, with the colleagues you meet on a corridor, come back and start working on a new feature. Now, and you should have reasonable expectation that if by that time your pipeline did not fail, if you didn't get notification that something is wrong, it should be reasonably safe to start working on a new thing. Now, as you see, that will depend from country to country, from culture to culture. If you're in uh, Nordic countries, then that's probably one minute. Uh, they're very efficient. If you're in the US, then this process might take 15 minutes. If you're in Spain, that's anything between one hour and three hours. So really how much time you need for, for to fetch coffee and drink it depends. But that's more or less the, your measurement of the duration of, of a pipeline. Otherwise, context switching. And actually, even worse thing is that if you receive a notification that some that your previous feature failed in while you're working on a new one, you're most like you're there are big chances that you're gonna ignore that notification and say, I'm gonna fix it tomorrow, or I'm gonna fix it next week. And when that happens, it's even worse. It's much worse because the longer time it passes uh, between you producing a bug and detecting, uh, sorry, and fixing that bug, the longer the period, the more expensive it is to fix because it takes me anything between five and 15 seconds to fix something that I uh, caused uh, five minutes ago. If I, if I caused that problem an hour ago, it's already more expensive. I need to remember more things. You need to figure out what happened. If a day passes much more, a week, and so on and so forth. So fixing something uh, is the duration of fixing something is directly equivalent to the time it passed between producing a problem and fixing it. So let's go. Eight, those shall consider, consider fixing a failed pipeline as high as priority. And of course, this does not make any sense if your pipeline is, takes days to execute because then you're going to ignore it for sure. It's guaranteed. But the point is that, as I explained before, you want to fix a problem as soon as possible because while well, it's fresh in your mind and also before it affects your colleagues and before many other things happen. So you want to basically drop whatever you're doing and fix a problem. And if your pipeline is very fast, then there will be nothing to drop because you did not even, it's so fast that you did not even start working on the next feature, ideally. Or if you cannot accomplish that speed, at least don't make it last too long. So anyway, fixing, some, fixing a problem has highest priority, you fix it, you drop whatever you're doing, you fix it, and then you continue working on whatever you're working or hopefully you did not even start working on. 
<coughs> we're getting to, to the end. Uh, those shall <coughs> run uh, CD pipeline locally. That means that you should not rely on Jenkins to do everything for you. You should not just write random code, you know, you type, 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 commit to, to repository and say, let's see whether it compiles. I don't know, Jenkins will tell me that. Let's see whether my test pass. I don't know, Jenkins will tell me that. That's really disrespectful to your colleagues. You should, maybe not everything, but most of the things you should run locally. You do your code, you test your code, you check whether it builds, you do most of the things locally, and when you re have reasonable assurance where you're confident in what you did, then you push it, it will, be, it will go through a pipeline again together with the, the rest of the code of your colleagues and so on and so forth. But think of Jenkins more or whatever tool you, whichever tool you're using as additional layer of uh, security, additional layer of processes, not as something that would, that would mean that you don't need even to build your code locally that you're gonna, that you have a license to commit anything to repository just because there is Jenkins. And if for, besides all those reasons, it's really not respectful to your colleagues because your colleagues are going to fork your code and they're gonna work on it assuming that you did their job right and it's going to be just an awful code because you're not even compiling, you're not testing yourself, you're letting Jenkins do it and uh, between the build and somebody forking, uh, you get just bad code propagated all around your organization. And that leads us to the last one. And this is the one that people freak out because uh, we were taught for, for many years, most of the history of software, at least most of the history since first uh, version controls appeared, is that we should have branches. I disagree. I think that we should, when we reach this level of proficiency, we should all commit to master. And why shouldn't we? Because if you really trust the process, if you really trust that we did everything else correctly, the process will prevent our commit from moving further and we will be notified very fast and we will move forward and correct the error very fast. Uh, now you don't, I can, I can imagine some of you going left and right with your head saying, yeah, what about feature branches? Now, there is nothing essentially wrong with feature branches, even though I prefer committing directly to master. Feature branches are okay as long as you merge them to master at least once a day, if they are really short-lived. If they're not short-lived, if, if you have a branch that lasts for days or weeks or even months, then really, until you merge it to, to, to master, you don't know whether that integrates with the rest of the code. And that really means that there is nothing continuous in your process. That, as I said before, you can just as well call it eventual integration or eventual delivery, deployment, whatever you're doing. So really, and being afraid to commit to master means that you don't trust your process so well that you, you can do it. And that's normal. If you don't trust your process, then don't commit to master, don't have short-lived branches, work on trusting your process, work going through the rest of the commandments before you reach this, this state. So those are the test com uh, 10 commandments. Master is really the last one. Master is the only thing that matters. Even if you use branches, uh, I don't care much if you use branches, as long as it gets to master, directly or indirectly, merging or not, or committing directly, as long as it gets to master fairly often, you will be fine. You can call yourself a master of continuous delivery, continuous deployment, whatever it is. So, a short recap, uh, commandments told by him, and I'm just your messenger, so please don't send me hate mails. Uh, first of all, those shall be agile and truly agile, meaning that you shall remove your silos department, start working as a team uh, before moving anything anywhere further, remove the lean time, remove waiting time, remove silly administrative tasks that will prevent you from doing something all the time continuously. Refactor your code, make it testable. Don't just try to put tests on top of your piece of art. Make your code testable first 
and then we can de go, you can you can proceed further and make the really really efficient process. Educate everyone, explain teams, everybody that continues delivery, continuous deployment, building, testing, all those things are part of their daily jobs. That's not a job of a specialized separate department of silo. That job of every single de de developer. If you don't, after all, how can you? You cannot not understand the process. You cannot say I'm a coder who doesn't know how to test. Because if you don't know how to test, then your code will be untestable. If you don't know how to deploy, then your code will be undeployable. And that applies to every single special. Whatever you're specialized in, you need to understand the process. You need to live the process, and then do whatever your specialty tells you to do. Uh, small teams, small applications. Uh, the smaller the things are, the faster they move, the easier they are. If, if, if you have an application where 200 people work on, I mean, there is no way on earth that you will ever do something efficiently. Simply, it's physics, it doesn't work. Those should practice the test driven development. Uh, you need to write your tests first. <coughs> then you, you write your uh, code that implements those tests, then you run tests one more time, they, first time they fail, second time, time they succeeded. You push your, your, your change to repository and a pipeline will execute and everything will be pitch and you will be living in Disneyland. You should define your pipeline as code. Everything today is code. There is no reason why your pipeline shouldn't be code. UIs are dead. They are uh, they're simply not efficient. We know that everything is called create Jackie's pipeline, write it uh, inside of Jackie's file, put the Jackie's file in a repository, and on every commit, Jackie's will read uh, the contents of Jackie's file and do whatever Jackie's file tells it to do. In other words, execute their process. Uh, you should have a fast pipeline. Most of the world, that's uh, uh, everywhere, that's time to fetch coffee, drink it, go back and work on something else. Everywhere, most of the world, that's 15 minutes approximately. If you live in Spain, that's approximately two hours. I know from experience that's where I live. Uh, fixing a failed pipeline, fixing a failed build is the highest priority. You drop whatever you're doing. If you start working on something new, you drop it, you fix the problem, and then when you problem for three, you can think about the next problem to solve. You run your most, not all, you, because that might be unreasonable, you might not want to run locally performance tests or some other types of things. But mo if not all, most of the pipeline should be executable locally. Have your scripts, uh, use Docker to set up whatever you need, uh, run containers uh, or whatever. If you, live in, uh, if, you, if you live in the past, use Vagrant, that's still okay. Whatever, whatever works best for you but make sure that you can run everything locally. And since we already clarified that everything is very fast and that applications are small, 16 gigabyte laptop that which all of us have today should be more than enough to run everything you need and for that something to be fast and uh, then you push it. And don't use databases as a queues, learn how to mock instead of uh, claiming that it's not testable because I don't have a whole system on my laptop. Learn how to mock, it's a useful, useful knowledge it will help you a lot. And finally, you shall commit things to master branch directly. If you are afraid to do that, short-lived branches, feature branches, one day, not longer, they mer merge it to master, kill the branch, destroy it as if it never existed again. If you need to continue working on, on that feature, use feature toggles to disable the feature so it's not visible to others. <coughs> Start a new day uh, by making another fork, or merging back from master to your feature branch, continue working, working, merge back to master. Everything gets to master at least once a day. At least. If you can do it faster, even better. <coughs> now, you know how those things work? When he says you need to follow things, then you have only two options. You either do it, if you don't do it, if you don't follow him, his word, you know where you go. I don't need to tell you the word. Uh, but I can tell you that Eternity over there is not pleasant, so please do whatever he said. And now just try to see where you are. Try to see where you can get. Uh, make a plan. Try to get there. It's really, 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 really rewarding at the end. 
this is me. That's my Twitter tweet. Even if you tweet this was awful, that's still okay. That's feedback. I like that. Uh, my blog, read it. Uh, some courses, don't buy it. Uh, some YouTube videos. My books, it's very important. That's the 11th commandment. You cannot do anything successful if you don't buy my books. So I really suggest that you buy it immediately. And uh, let me see back to, let me see whether there are some questions. Are there any questions? I hope so. Otherwise. This was really boring. Okay, start writing your questions. I just uh, pass one over to you, Victor. Do you see that come in? Yeah, yes, yes, I see it. Cool. Let me read it first and then choose whether the question is good or not. How would you handle a CD when it comes to enterprise processes? So, how would you, the question is, how would you handle a CD when it comes to enterprise processes? I don't see a real reason why. I mean, it depends what enterprise processes are. The fact that the company is enterprise does not mean that it has to be to have processes from medieval times. Unfortunately, more most enterprises do have, and that's that, that's my point, and that's why I put agile for, as a first requirement. You need to really make a cultural change first. I really don't believe that you can throw technology behind a cultural problem you need to become lean, you need to start trusting each other, you need to remove uh, unnecessary administrative tasks, you need to change the culture first, and culture, uh, processes are always reflection of a culture. Actually, even code is reflection of a culture. That's why we have so many monolithic applications, because we have monolithic organizations with heavy processes, and so many layers, and so on and so forth. So change your processes first, and then move forward. Become agile, and when I say agile, I don't really mean scrum or this or that. I mean agile in a literal meaning of the word of principles. Whether you're scrum, whether you're XP, my favorite is XP. It doesn't really matter which flavor you choose. Choose none. That's okay. Just change your processes. Start doing things that make sense, not things that somebody wrote 20 years ago and you are still following. If you don't agree, Vishnesh, Vishesh, something like that, just uh, write another question and we're going to discuss it heavily. So, another one. I'm learning how to create Jackie's pipelines. Are there any books you recommend? Uh, we, CloudBees, we have some trainings, we have a lot of videos, a uh, uh, lot of blog posts. I have a lot of examples in my books as well. There are other books written. Uh, I, I think that we have more than, th there is a lot of material. You can do it all for free uh, if you don't want to spend a dime. But I think that uh, if, if, if anything is a problem, that's not lack of material. Uh, just Google it uh, or, or ping me, for example. Send me email, ping me later. I'll, I'll try to find you better, uh, some good resources. That's, that's very easy, but it's readily available. How do you account for re-architecturing efforts? Doing them linearly in master would increase development and testing complexity by an order of magnitude, yes or no? I don't agree with that. I think that not architecturing things is increasing development and testing complexity. I think that we inevitably end up with a pile of um, strange things in our code it's things are getting more uh, things are getting more and more complex more screwed up more uh, tangled spaghetti like of things and i really think that uh, refactoring is the only way to uh, continue making something that is easy to maintain now if if you have application that is like 10 years old uh 20 years old uh i would suggest start uh shipping it out. May I mean, at some point applications get to the point where, uh, to the state where they're not really worth touching anymore. There are those cases. If that's the case, then just develop a new feature instead of adding new features to that application, split it into a separate service, do it well, and uh, slowly, one by one, start removing it, moving it outside. There are patterns how to do that with a relatively low cost. The major really cost is how to start learn how to design things differently and to think in a different way. But once the learning curve is passed, I don't think there is a 
such a big cost. I mean, to me, the real cost is uh, spending a full day to change a label because we need to do regression tests because we don't have our tests and then uh, because our, we don't know what will break and all those things. Um, yeah, if anyone has a question, make sure you get it in. Say again? I was just saying, if anyone else does have a question, make sure to get it in. Yeah, yeah, please do, please do. All right, let's give this a... Uh... Am I so offensive that nobody dares to even speak with me? Is that the case? <laughs> Sad accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is, is it my, my, my strange sounding accent? That might be the case. <laughs> Next time, Max will uh, do simultaneous tra uh, translation of what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> I'll read your script. <laughs> exactly. Oh, wait. Let's uh, take a look. Here we go. One moment. There you go. Uh, have you seen an effective strategy for dealing with unautomatable manual testing? Uh, I think that the most effective strategy is uh, leave that application rotting somewhere. Don't touch it. Uh, start. Uh, it's similar to previous answer. I think the most effective is to start moving parts of that application outside and doing it, doing doing feature as separate services, and then uh, use there are quite a few patterns how to. Uh, forward requests to old application or new service, depending on how you do it. Uh, I don't know, if it's a COBOL application written and running on a mainframe and everybody's afraid of touching it, then when you're afraid of to touch an application, the best thing is not to touch it. Leave it rotting somewhere. Make a new service. All right. Here, we got one more coming in for you. Mm -hmm. mm. So the question is, steps to be able to work only in master. Is there a good list of techniques? Um, so uh, you need first to, to, to have heavy automation and to trust it. So you need to trust that uh, automation automated processes, building testing, uh, unit testing, feature testing, whatever testing you're doing is, uh, you trust it so much that you believe that it will detect problems automatically and very fast. Uh, now there are other things like, for example, of course, uh, we cannot be real unrealistic. Uh, there are obviously features that uh, cannot be done in a matter of hours, in a matter of a day. Uh, I try to break them into such small chunks that, that they're doable fast, but sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes it takes us days, uh, hopefully never more than a week to develop a feature. Uh, and then uh, I think one of the one of the techniques I really like is feature toggles. Uh, there are frameworks that can allow you to implement feature toggles, or it's simply if else statement in your code that you say, okay, this thing is uh, only part of the feature. I'm gonna commit to master, it's gonna be deployed to production, but nobody is going to see it except maybe selected users or testers or whatever, right? Uh, so you, you can, it's, it's relatively easy to hide a feature when it's uh, partly done. And uh, other techniques, uh, test and development, I think it's very important. As I said before, trusting automation is important. Uh, it's simply trusting, having things automated and trusting the process, whatever the process is, that will do the right thing. Uh, and then the, I intentionally put uh, committing to master as the last commandment. Actually, not me. He intentionally told me that committing to master is the last commandment because you really need to master all of the previous processes and techniques in order to get that far. I think that that's the last step. Uh, in, in, in a journey towards continued deployment. Uh, don't try to, put, to start committing to master before you master um, uh, the rest of, of, of skills, I think. Uh, what resources, books books would you recommend for learning to shift processes, process to CD paradigm, 
Uh, I think I answered that before, maybe for pipelines, but I think it applies to CD. Uh, first of all, my books, of course, that's the most important because they are the best. There is no better writer than me. Uh, no, no, on a serious note. Uh, Martin Fowler, for example, wrote a lot about it. Uh, Jess Humble uh, is a good source as well. Uh, and there are a few others. I don't want to make now commercial, but if I would need to put two figures, that would be three. Let's go with three names. Jess Humble, Martin Fowler, and uh, who would be the third one? The uh, BDD guy. Uh, oh, I forgot his name. Google Behavior Driven Development. Dan North. Dan North is, is, is one of the, my favorites. About, it's not necessarily, they're not, all the books are not necessarily about CD because CD, the CD is, uh, is, uh, is a combination of practices and requirements for that to be fulfilled. So you don't, you don't necessarily need to, to search only for books on, on CD. You can uh, search uh, master test and development, master behavior and development, master feature toggles, master uh, become agile. So uh, it's, not a, it's not a single subject. It's a collection of subjects. And once they're mastered, uh, continuous delivery, continuous deployment becomes fairly easy, straightforward because at the end, it's a combination of things. Hello, I am good old Mormon and enjoy the human. Even more so, I enjoy the validation of some of my DevOps principles. Tom, you're my man. I, I really, I, I, I really, uh, I really like for what you wrote. I, I thank you so much for that. I think it wasn't the question. And uh, thank you for enjoying the humor. I cannot be politically correct. It's against my uh, nature. I have no questions from Roberto. I have no questions, but want to comment that I love the presentation and, pre and the presenter. Now, uh, before I read the rest of, of your, your text, Roberto, please send that to CTO of CloudBees and tell him that they deserve a raise. That's very important. Help me out here. Uh, it was a reality check for the work I do with my team and clarify that we are already doing correctly and some of the work we still have ahead. Roberto, same thing as Tom. I'm really, uh, I'm thrilled to hear that. I, I'm really thrilled that people are, that uh, those things are catching up. I am really thrilled to hear uh, positive, uh, getting positive feedback, getting, um, uh, learning that, that there are, uh, that there are companies, organizations, teams that do it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, as an explanation, my product involves monetary transaction with real banknotes and real coins. We can't, we can't automate this kind of testing. We need a human to operate a machine to insert remove money to create the trans transactions. Imagine testing a real ATM machine. If you have seen that works great, please let me know. Uh, of course, now I, I agree, uh, Patrick. We cannot automate everything. And I, I actually, that was my fault, not stressing that. Of course, we cannot automate everything. Uh, that should not prevent us from automating everything that can be automated. So, uh, for example, ATMs are a good example. Of course, you, you, cannot, you cannot automate testing that the coins get out from the slot. Actually, when I think about it, I, even that can be automated partly. Uh, I worked uh, in my past life with lotteries. And we did manage to automate similar processes, uh, not exactly the same, but similar with similar challenges because we had similar machines, uh, similar to ATM and stuff like that. Now, what we couldn't do uh, is automate everything, but uh, most of the functions of ATM are not really related with uh, coins. So, uh, what I truly want to say is that uh, not being to automate, not being able to automate everything, shouldn't be ex excuse not to automate everything that is automatable. And if that means that you automate 95% instead of 100, that's great. If you, automate, if you automate 60% instead of zero, that's still great. Anything is better than nothing. Uh, and if you cannot get to 100%, that's okay. But don't, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that's not your case, Patrick, but uh, for others that are not listening right now, don't uh, don't don't say I'm not going to automate 
anything because I cannot automate everything. Do what you can. Uh, uh, now from Reynaldo, if I pronounce names wrongly, please please don't take it uh, in the wrong way. Uh, apart, apart from your company, what do you consider is the percentage of companies are fully applying these commandments? Very small, unfortunately really small. I actually think that it's a very small companies that uh, that are doing, not continuous deployment, that are doing things really right and uh, up to date with their industries today. And I think that <clears throat> the gap is increasing. Uh, I think that the current situation of software industry is that we have a relatively small percentage of companies, uh, some startups, Google, Amazon, stuff like that, but a relatively small percentage of companies. I'm going to throw a number, let's say, let's say 10%. I really don't know what the real number is, but the small that uh, are very, very advanced. And then there, are, there is the rest of us. Now, uh, the problem with, with, with software industry is that in any other industry, there are all shades of gray between the top performance and bottom performance. There are all, there is everybody else. There is in software industry, software industry special is that there is a huge gap in, uh, between top performance and everybody else. There is nothing in between. And that gap is so big that, it, that at moments it looks like we're never going to get there. We're never going to be as good as, I'm not going to name now companies, but you know, those companies you really put on a pedestal because they're good, doing great things. And, and it very often looks like it, we cannot get there. And I, I don't think it's true. I think that we can get there but only if we are willing to change. Uh, a willingness to change is probably the biggest uh, problem that prevents us to change, which is kind of obvious. Uh, I sound philosophical. Um, but very a short answer, Ronaldo, it's very small percentage of companies are top performance, as easy as that. And all of them, I think, are doing uh, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, uh, and the rest of us are gonna be eaten by competition, stop existing, or improve. Unless we are in an industry where there is no competition, I don't know, state controlled something and things like that. <clears throat> Anybody else? I don't even know, Max, you need to stop me. I don't know whether we have time. Yeah, so that was the last one for now, and I think we are going to wrap it up because we're a little after the hour. So just to be mindful of everyone's time. But uh, thank you, everyone, for staying with us uh, even past the hour, for the great questions that you asked, for being attentive. I hope you all like this as much as, uh, as, much as we like putting this one on. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at a few more of the sessions on this series. And thank you to uh, Victor for presenting. Thank you, Max, and thank you all of you for listening and not running away immediately. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.